There no longer stands a German line in the West. Instead, American, Canadian, and British troops drive forward on almost every sector, enveloping small pockets of resistance and crumbling hedgehogs. These films were the last ever made by a courageous man, Gaston Madru, who was killed by enemy fire immediately afterwards. After a bitter fight, the great city of Leipzig falls. The radio station is taken intact. The intricate equipment, which it might have taken the Allies months to replace, stands ready for their use. Farther south, Nuremberg, smashed, death-ridden, and in Allied hands. It was in Nuremberg, the holy city of Nazism, that each year before the war, a great party rally was held at which Hitler spoke, in the stadium built by the Nazis for this very purpose. Now it is empty. An American soldier stands where Hitler stood. A German soldier who will never listen to any more speeches. Major General Feit, German commander of Brunswick, surrenders to his American captor, Major General Hobbs. And in Brunswick, a camp for British officer prisoners is overrun. Riotously, 2,200 of them greet their American liberators. Food and cigarettes are the order of the day. While at a camp to the west of the Rhine, German troops from the Rohr pocket stream in in ever-increasing numbers. 75,000 was the count at one time. Some old men, some children, and large numbers of fit young soldiers. A Czech who had spent six years in a concentration camp was sent through to ferret out Gestapo men. On his arms, the Germans had tattooed his prison number. In the great drive through the heart of Germany, 12 German generals were captured by American troops. One, though retired and in civilian clothes, surrendered voluntarily. Here is the backbone of the German army. In central Germany, troops of the Third Army uncovered Germany's gold reserve hidden in a salt mine. Gold and foreign currencies worth millions. And art treasures from German museums, stored here for safekeeping. Rembrandts, Raphaels, Leonardos, and a Renoir. It is not yet decided what shall be done with them. The town of Stendal formally surrenders to the Allies. Civilians are registered by military authorities. Ration cards are validated. Housing is made available by requisition. The town is put into working order. Crowds gather in the marketplace to hear Allied orders, to read the Allied proclamations disbanding the Nazi party, Nazi laws and institutions. Civilians, conscious that they are thoroughly beaten, obey readily. Uniforms are turned in. Post-war Germany will have no armies. Arms are surrendered, pistols, swords, daggers, sabers. They will be destroyed. And meanwhile, the British and American armies surge on to their junction with the Russian alliance. Magdeburg on the Elbe. The garrison commander rejected an ultimatum to surrender, and so, with the air forces leading the way, the city had to be bombed and shelled into submission. When the pilots had done their work, tanks and infantry move in, across the freshly plowed fields, down the dusty roads, from every side, and an overwhelming force. Magdeburg is captured. An Allied armor fans out north and south, moving at ever-increasing tempo. And at Torgau on the Elbe, 
The great junction is made for which the world has so long waited. And now, the British, the American, and the Red Armies begin the last battles with a common front in a broken and dismembered Germany.